Good morning. How y'all doing today? One less hour of sleep? That's the bummer. Um, some of y'all might have thought that Greg was preaching since he did the pastoral prayer, but surprise! It's the family pastor preaching about children. All right? Um, well, let's dive in, okay? Last year, you know, I, during the COVID time and everybody was at home and probably spending a lot more time on their screens and their computers than they should have, I came across an article by a man named Tim Urban who laid out the human lifespan visually, like in increments of time, kind of like these, this picture up here, like different, just like blocks of it. And then he adapted this visual so that he could see how much time he had spent with his parents. And so being super optimistic, just for the sake of his slaughter experiment, Tim assumed that now in his life, he still had about 30 years of coexistence with his parents, and then tallied up his in-person days with mom and dad throughout lifetime and what he was anticipating he had left. And after doing this, he writes, I've been thinking about my parents who are in their mid-60s, and during my first 18 years, I spent some time with my parents during at least 90% of my days. But since heading off to college and then later moving out of Boston, I've probably seen them an average of only five times a year each for an average of maybe two days each time, 10 days a year, about 3% of the days I spent with them each year of my childhood. And he says this, it turns out that when I graduated from high school, I had already used up 93% of my in-person parent time. I'm now enjoying the last 5% of that time. We're in the tail end. Now realize that some of you may look back at the in-person time of your parents and it's not so rosy. There's not a lot of delight there. And I'm, and I'm sorry for that. And then I also realize that we're on the west side of Cincinnati and many of you are just a stone's throw away from your parents, your grandchildren, you know, your, your grandchildren, your your own children. But my guess is that the majority, hopefully, except for some legitimate exceptions, I know there are some in this room, you're not living in the same household as your parents, especially if you're married. You may have your own household now with little ones running around that God has put into your care. You are the parents now. But just think about Mr. Urban's observations for just a moment. If we have children who experience a similar scenario like him, 93% or at least a high percentage of your in-person time with your children will be completely through, done by the time they graduate from high school. You then enter the final stretch of your in-person days with them, that like final 10% of seeing them face to face. Praise God for all of the the screens that we have that can talk to them, Signal, WhatsApp, Facebook, all these things that maybe add a little bit more on there, but it's still not the same, we know that, from everything that we experienced with COVID. There's a difference between face-to-face versus through a screen. And when you think about this final stretch, two things come to mind. One, we really need to savor and treat the remaining in-person time we have with our parents. <clears throat> so, like, I mean, I was talking to Stephen yesterday as we were driving back from Renown. His parents are coming up here this upcoming weekend. My parents are coming up next weekend. I'm in the final 10% of seeing them. It's precious. But then the other thing is us parents need to realize how great of a stewardship we have with our own children the first 18 years we have. Our children are a gift from God. And you guys have a huge opportunity with them in your household right this moment during their young age. Which brings me to our passage today. A passage that I pray is dear or will become dear to every single Christian parents' heart in this room, every Christian grandparent, every Christian school teacher, you guys get to see little ones' faces too. 
every Grace Kids servant up here, every student ministry volunteer, you get to see these kids face to face. The Holy Spirit has placed these precious ones in our lives for a time. And the Holy Spirit has put these words here in Luke 18 for our encouragement and edification. So in this short, precious time that we have together in person, I pray that God will do that very thing to us, encourage and edify us. Will you pray with me one more time? (laughs) Father God, I pray now that you would give me the strength and my weakness to preach your word. God, that you would be honored and magnified. God, that we would see how glorious you are, how we need Jesus like a child. We need the Father. We need you, Father, like a child. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Look back at the text that was read this morning. Luke 18, it says, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter into it. For our purposes this morning, I'm going to break down this passage into three parts. The objection, the correction, and finally instruction, which we're going to spend the majority of the time there. The objection, the correction, and the instruction. The first is the objection. Luke 18, 15 to the beginning of verse 16. You see, our passage this morning, it comes at the end of a long section in Luke's gospel from verse 951 to the middle of chapter 19. And it's devoted to Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, um, which he's going to be crucified there. That's his mission, is to get there. And Mark only gives you one chapter about this journey, Luke gives you like 10. Um, But this is what it says at the beginning of the section. It says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. But if you read these chapters, you'll realize, Jesus, this is not the most efficient way. There's no traffic to stop you. Why aren't you just taking the straight shot? He meanders around the countryside And makes his way to all these different towns, all these different villages with stops along the way. And he's doing that to meet up these special occasions where he is then going to teach his disciples and us about his kingdom. He's going to confront our misunderstandings about the world, what's really real, and then teach us how his kingdom is better. Let's see how this scene unfolds. Go back to the text. It says, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. You see, Luke gives an account that Matthew and Mark also give us. And the they here, we're just going to assume, it makes sense, that the parents in the crowd are the they, that they're bringing these infants to him. In other accounts of the story, a different word is used. It just says children. But here, the word that Luke uses is often translated infant or babe. It's, it's like the little guys, all right? The toddlers, the nursery section, all right? Um, this was used of early childhood and beyond the toddler age. The same word. If you remember Christmas time, we look at the Gospel of Luke a lot. It's used for John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb and baby Jesus. It's the same word. So Luke is emphasizing that these parents are bringing their littlest ones to Jesus. But why would they do that? What's the purpose behind setting up this meeting with Jesus? Well, Luke tells us that he might touch them. But what's so great about Jesus' touch? Why would a mom or dad want Jesus to touch their child? Well, Luke, a lot of times when Jesus touches um, people, or they touch him, healing or cleansing tends to happen. If you recall that he'll cleanse a leper, he heals diseases, he cures unclean spirits, he raises a widow's son from the dead. The woman with the, the, the blood disease issue grabs his, his back and she's healed. And yet despite this reality of the way touching is used in Luke, Mark's gospel with the same account actually gives us a clearer answer to our question. Mark ten sixteen reads, that he took them in his arms and blessed them. 
laying his hands on them. What they're seeking with this touch is the embrace and blessing of Christ for their children, that his favor and grace would be upon them. I mean, think about like in olden times, um, the, the kings would come into the, the town and loyal subjects, they're delighted with their king. Um, they, man, if you had an opportunity where the king was to come over and like bless your child, that was awesome. A lot of you get this because you come from like a Roman Catholic background, right? When the Pope comes into town, oh my gosh, if he can touch you, what a tremendous thing, right? How much more the actual King Jesus, the ruler, the head of the church. King Jesus is making his way through their town. And this brings up an opportunity for for him to lay his hands upon them. So surely these parents, they want to take this opportunity. They want to walk up and go to him who's meek and mild and receive this bliss blessing. But these parents en route to Jesus, they meet discouragement from those you would think would be the encouragers. Like, yeah, come on. Let Jesus bless you. It says, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Previous to this, a lot of times what was being said about rebuke, the word rebuke was used to rebuke demons out of like people. Jesus was rebuking evil things and they rebuke parents bringing their children to Jesus. They're just sitting back watching the scene unfold and as soon as the parents get close, they rebuke them. These apostles in training, they disapprove of this activity. But why? Why would they do such a thing? Well, it's because in their opinion, blessing the children was a waste of Jesus' time, which doesn't make sense because if, you know, remember, he's been meandering all throughout the countryside anyways. (laughs) He's not in any hurry. He knows the time set. He has the schedule perfectly in mind of what he's doing. But in the disciples' mind, there is no need for him to interact with these kiddos. Their view of infants, of children, It had actually momentarily conformed to the ideas of the unbelieving world. You see, children in the time of the Roman Empire were pretty low on the social ladder. In fact, Cicero once wrote concerning childhood, the thing itself cannot be praised, only its potential, only what could be. Childhood in itself is loathsome. They're just running around, snotty noses. But they could grow up to be kings. You know, like that's the, that's the excitement there. Roman law actually regarded children with a super low legal position by granting them no rights of their own and actually allowing brutal practices towards them to go unpunished, like exposing infants outside in the elements. This was the first century abortion. And sadly, many of those exposed infants, they either died Or they were picked up by strangers and raised for profit as either slaves or prostitutes or beggars. Now, of course, I'm not saying the disciples have completely embraced all of this wrongful line of thinking. They would have been horrified by the idea of exposing an infant. Because they had this Jewish understanding rooted in the Old Testament that they were supposed to love children, raise them up, Deuteronomy 6, teaching them as they go along the way. But as Jesus is going along the way, they think it's a waste of his time. They're acting like these children were neither eligible nor important recipients of Jesus' ministry. He had more pressing matters to attend to, like teaching adults (laughs) and getting to Jerusalem to die. But what is ironic is that Jesus has already taught them the opposite of what they just did, what they're practicing. In Luke 9, 48, Jesus tells the disciples, after taking a child and putting him by his side, he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. 
See, the reality is that Christians can do the same thing with our children in the church. We can receive them in a different name than Jesus. I've heard parents say to some effect, I don't want to push Christianity too much on my children. They need to grow up and make their own choices. Now, surely, yeah, I agree, you can't force them to believe. In fact, you can be too harsh and, and make the things of God not a delight to them, but a, but a bore. It, uh, it can be annoying and frustrating. And, and we know there's no chil- grandchildren of God. Individuals, each of them must repent and believe the gospel. But when we act like children, these children who God has placed in our care should not hear and be blessed by the same good news that has transformed us, what we are espousing is an unbiblical idea. An idea that is foreign to the scriptures, that is more in attune with the things of the world. It's a product of the enlightenment, of secularism, making you think that Jesus' authority does not speak into your child's life directly, or it only speaks into one part of it. But it speaks into it all because he's king over everything. Your life and everything in your child's life, their mind, their bodies, their emotions, their friends, their education, their extracurriculars, their schedules, all the in-person time you still have with them. Christ is king over all of it. Christian mom and dad, it should be a tremendous blessing that your children were placed in your home and not an unbelieving parent's home. Your home, not an unbelieving parent's home. But oddly enough, like we see here, the disciples, they chide parents who who yearn for Jesus to receive their children. But it's the disciples who need correction, not the parents that are trying to bring their children to Jesus. So the correction, Luke 18, 16. Jesus does not appreciate the reaction of his apprentices. In fact, the parallel account in Mark 10, 14 gives us a little more detail. It shows us the emotion of Christ in this moment. It says, when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. He was angry at them hindering the children from coming to him. Jesus calls the disciples over, but not to condemn them, to correct them. To correct them with his loving words. Verse 16, but Jesus called them to him, saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes it's helpful to ask yourself and say, who, who would I be in this story? If you were to reflect on and examine your own life and heart, which character in the biblical narrative are you most like? And maybe sometimes it's not just like your entire life, but in a moment, who are you acting more like? Have I been more like these parents in the crowd investing the time to bring their children to Jesus? Or have I been like the disciples here who think Christ is too busy with adult things to interact with and bless them? Brothers and sisters, we need to heed the exhortation of the pastor, um, Cotton Mather, who once said, do you not know that your children have precious and immortal souls within them? They are not all flesh. You who are the parents of their flesh must know that your children have spirits also. Our focus on the growth of our children cannot be just concerned with the physical. That's important. You go to the doctor, make sure the development's going well. Feed them. You let them run around. You gotta wrestle with them on the floor, especially if you got boys. (laughs) You want their bodies to grow, but they are also souls. And in light of this important truth, Jesus' question comes to us, what does it profit a child to gain the whole world, yet lose his soul? When we think about all of our kids' schedules and activities, we need to ask what or who they are for. 
What's the motivation behind this busyness? Busyness in and of itself isn't sinful. But what's behind it? And sometimes we can get to the heart of it and we can see that Jesus is not actually there. He's not the all-encompassing sinner of which everything revolves around. He's not the, the reality in which all of these things are built upon, the foundation. He's not king over all of these activities. And then we want Christ's blessing on our children, but we live like he isn't our king or theirs. We don't even take our children to him knowing that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through him. Instead, like the disciples, our schedules rebuke the blessing of Jesus. And through our disordered calendars and fears that our kids will miss out on the things of the world, they could miss out on heaven. They could miss out on the kingdom. So we need to constantly crucify our love for this world. Our priorities, they'll get knocked off kilter if we're, if we're not careful. And we'll neglect this pediatric cultivation that the Bible calls us to. And it's in response to this rebuke that we see Jesus two loving imperatives in this passage. One's positive and one's negative. First, he positively says, let or allow or permit the children to come to me. And then secondly, he says, don't hinder them. Don't put up roadblocks. Don't put up walls. Let them come. And this charge is directed to, of all people, the disciples. These are the guys who are the future leaders of the early church. And it reverberates down to us today. Jesus is telling them that one of their objectives as missionaries for the kingdom of God is to remember the children. Missionaries cross boundaries, right? Usually cultural, linguistic boundaries. Have you ever thought about you crossing the boundary of your age from one generation to the next? That's what parents get to do. Your missionaries crossing that chasm between of 25-ish years, I mean, how much it is between you and your children and bringing them the gospel. And the gospel of Luke teaches us that the good news, it comes to those we least expect. The kingdom of God comes demanding a complete reversal of our thinking. The first century Roman world, as we already kind of alluded to, looks down on the poor, the disabled, the uneducated, They even look down on women, and they look down on children. And the gospel turns the corrupted world upside down and restructures it rightly in Christ. Jesus says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. How have you been hindering your children? What obstacles, maybe unknowingly, have you thrown up out in front of them? Because you could say that We're called to ministries like John the Baptist for our children, preparing the way of the Lord, making their paths as straight as possible to the Messiah. And we seek as much as humanly possible to take every mountain and hill and and push it down and every valley and, and bring it up and make it level so that our sons and daughters, the children of our church, will see, hear, and believe Christ all the while trusting that it is the Spirit alone that convicts, saves, and sanctifies. We're always to be intentional, bringing our children to Jesus, letting these little and bigger ones come to him. And it's not an option. It's not a preference. It's a command. A command like every command in the Bible that can only be obeyed by faith. It can only be obeyed by faith. Faith that Jesus alone can save your children. Faith that God has graciously and sovereignly ordained you, not someone else, to be their fathers and mothers. Faith that is utterly reliant on the Father for everything. It's by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that you've been saved, that you've been been brought to Jesus before to be blessed, and that you now have this gift of citizenship in the kingdom of God that you wish to see them grow up into 
But the nature of this faith, as we'll see now in Jesus' word, is not childish, but it's childlike. You must be like a child to raise your children. <laughs> Which is, the final part here is the instruction. Luke 18, 17. And this is where we're going to spend the um, majority of our time. <clears throat> Jesus grounds his command to let the children come to me and to not hinder them in the cosmic reality that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children. Look at verse 17. Jesus preaches to us, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now what does it mean to receive the kingdom like a child? It doesn't mean to be childish, right? I mean, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, and when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So, there's a difference like a child here than what is in Luke. There's a difference between a childlike attitude and, and more of a childish one. That's kind of like grow up. So what does childlike faith look like? Well, first, which is front and center in our text, is that childlike faith is humble and reliant on the Father. Childlike faith is humble and reliant on the Father. And just really quickly, three ways that, that, that it plays out, three ways that we're reliant is we're reliant on his righteousness, his wisdom, and his riches. Righteousness, wisdom, and riches. So we're reliant on his righteousness. Have you ever had a child shout at you, that's not fair? <laughs> no, never, right? <laughs> not this morning. <laughs> um, now sometimes there might be an actual injustice done but many times the accusation, it could be rooted in just a kid not getting his own way and being inconvenienced from his little plans. And in those moments, that little one has decided that he's the arbiter of right and wrong. I am the eternal judge of this situation. <laughs> he's created his own law and really, that law is really favorable to him. All of his whims. He's never guilty. He's always right. But it's really judgmental of everybody else. In both Matthew and Mark, this episode about Jesus receiving children comes after Jesus' discourse on divorce and remarriage. But here in Luke, it comes after the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. And I don't think it's an accident because I think what, what Luke is doing is teaching us a certain attitude that is receptive to the kingdom of God. Look at Luke 18, 10 through 14, the passage right before it. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing off, Far, uh, far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This childish Pharisee possessed a self-righteous attitude toward his, this tax collector and to God. He doesn't compare himself to the Lord's holy character and find himself wanting. Instead, he goes after the easy target. Look at that tax collector over there. I'm so glad I'm not like that lowly publican. But the tax collector is humble like a child. He's like a child. He knows he's dependent upon the Father's mercy because he's so sinful. He doesn't have righteousness in and of himself. He needs something outside of himself. He's reliant upon his father. He knows he's not taller than him. He can't look down on the father. In fact, he doesn't even look up. But childlike faith looks up to God for help, not down on others with arrogance and contempt. And they understand they're unable to survive apart from the father's responsibility over him. And he truly is good and just. They're reliant upon his righteousness. A second way they're reliant upon God is they're is his, uh, his wisdom. They're reliant on his wisdom. You know, children can get really excited about what they're learning about, right? 
and talk your ear off about all the facts of their most east, recent interests, whether it be, like this morning, for me, characters in Paw Patrol, <laughs> or as when I was a child, I liked to just wax eloquently about marine biology to my parents, which is why I became a Miami Dolphins fan. That's the only thing left of all of that. Or as one of the kids in our youth group recently did, he just started going off about Norse mythology. And I'm like, you go, bro. I don't know anything <laughs> about that. And all these things, honestly, like seriously, they truly do know more than you in those random areas. Like, let's not deny that. Like, they have more expertise there. And uh, I hope they steward that well. But kids can be proud and act like they're little know-it-alls about life, even though they have 25 plus years less experience than you. And you get like, duh, mom, or duh, dad. <laughs> or you're driving down the road and your son, who's, you know, been listening to the way the GPS guides you, tells you to turn right. And you're like, no, there are trees there. Like, I, you're like, I can't listen to you right now. You don't know what you're talking about. But childlike faith is humble about wisdom and knowledge. Children actually know in their gut that they don't know more about life than their parents. Even their words and actions communicate otherwise. Childlike humility regarding wisdom is necessary for entry into the kingdom of God. Think about this. Jesus says in Luke 10, 21, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. He reveals the mysteries of the kingdom to little children. The rich and the powerful elites, along with the fact-worshipping Pharisees, they can miss the most important truths in the entire universe. They can even be blind to the clear revelation of God in nature, despite having numerous degrees, lots of letters behind their names. And hypocrisy can abound when these brainiacs are shown that they were wrong on something and it was off or they contradicted and they're like, no, no, I'm still right. Like they just, <laughs> they just stick to it and they hold tight to it in their arrogance because repentance remains impossible then. They're too proud, they're puffed up, they think they have knowledge, but they lack wisdom, they lack understanding. But if you're like a child, the Father has graciously willed to show you the kingdom through the proclamation of the gospel. You recognize your deep need for true wisdom that the Father alone provides. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that kingdom of God is for those who don't think, okay? We're not just like checking our brains at the door. We're thinking people. Our king is glorified by the way we use our minds. He created them. In fact, our sanctification is tied to the renewing of our mind by reading the scriptures and our exercising dominion in the world, creating, cultivating, being fruitful, it requires a stewardship of the ability that he's given us in our minds to think about the world, to tinker, to innovate. But dear children, God's kingdom operates in an upside down manner from what we and our culture are more often inclined toward. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1, a well-known passage. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, that bring to things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness sanctification and redemption so that as it is written that the one who boasts boasts in the Lord our only boast is in the Lord God Almighty our father and we say I don't always know the answer but my daddy does I can 
ask him. He's shown me in his word. We don't boast in ourselves at all, not our good behavior, our smarts, or the things we have. We're also reliant upon the wealth of our father. We're reliant on his riches. So immediately following our text, you'll see the next passage underneath there in Luke 18 is about the rich young ruler. And as you might recall, this man claims he's been a good kid all of his life, obeying all the commandments, except he hadn't really kept the law, right? He had another God before him, and that was his money and possessions. The Bible calls this mammon, and he worshiped mammon, wealth and material things. But Jesus knows his heart, and he draws it out. He says, okay, if you follow these rules, go ahead. Why don't you just sell everything and uh, give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Easy enough, right? (laughs) No, that's that's way too much. His heart was woven into his idol. He wanted to cling to it. And he saw the prospect of giving it up as absolutely impossible. And it was impossible. So he clings to his stuff and goes home sad. You see, when we're childish, we can get really possessive over things, right? Our kids can act like things belong to them, even though we know whose bank account went down as a result of that purchase. (laughs) We know whose credit card statement has a notch on it because of that visit to Amazon. It wasn't theirs. Say, that's mine. I was playing with that. He took my fill in the blank. And because of sin, we all enter this world struggling with entitlement and jealousy. We think we deserve specific things even though we lack the currency to obtain them. And no child is able to provide for himself, right? Even if he inherits a lot of money, he hasn't come out of the womb knowing how to do budgets. Like, he hasn't come out of the womb knowing how to pay for things. Like, he needs somebody else to care for him. Being a mediator in that time. But childlike faith in God approaches all the things of the world with gratitude to him. It doesn't look at those things and say, I'm going to turn them into little gods. Little gods that steal their affections. No, he rightly sees them as gifts from God's hand. A childlike faith in you acknowledges that all you have is actually your father's. It all belongs to him. You're not a self-made man or woman, but a son, a daughter, dependent upon your father's abundant wealth. Truly, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And our Abba Father, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. It's all his. You just have loans. And like Isaiah 55 says, we can still come to the Lord without any money, and be provided with water, bread, and rich food that satisfies. This is kind of like a threads of hope. We try to act like the Father this way. People come in and they have nothing that they are going to give us, and we give them clothing. It's a picture of the Father. As children of God, we want to grow up to be more like our Father. We want to be like Him, the one who's righteous, who's wise. And that brings us to another trait of childlike faith. The first one is that um, we're humble. Childlike faith is humble and it's relying on the Father. The second is that a childlike faith wants to imitate his father, his daddy. In the garden at the fall, Adam and Eve failed to rely upon and trust God for everything. And they fell prey to the lie that he was keeping something from them. That he had not given them all that they needed. And the serpent preaches untruth to them when he said in Genesis 3, 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And as we know, buying into that lie has had devastating consequences that have reverberated throughout the world and throughout history all the way up until today. And the childish attitude that we saw there in the garden, it believes the father's not good. The father, we need to usurp his authority. We need to take it over, take charge. Even though we have no experience whatsoever, we wanna be boss babies. 
like Adam and Eve. But there's a huge difference between wanting to be like God, seeking to take his place and exalt ourselves up as king and as God, and growing in godliness, mimicking the Father's holy character. Ephesians 5, 1 says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. God's children want to imitate their heavenly Father because he is good. They want to grow in his wisdom and righteousness and riches of his grace, not in the wisdom, self-righteousness, and worship of possessions that characterize the world. And you guys know this. Either you've seen it or you've experienced it yourself. You've watched or you've had it happen. A son trying to be like dad while you're working in the garage or on your car or some other project, your little boy looks over your shoulder with curiosity as you're handling a drill or using a wrench and maybe holding your tongue because you threw the wrench accidentally, it fell down into the engine. What's daddy gonna do? I'm gonna imitate him, whatever he does. You're like, no, don't, don't imitate that. There's a curiosity of how you're gonna respond, wanting to imitate what dad's doing. Daughters, you... They do this too. They push a chair up beside the counter and they want to see how mommy prepares dinner. And then, once they've gotten a little tutorial, they go to the little play kitchen and little apron and all and they cook their own Melissa and Doug casserole made completely of wood. (laughs) That's what they do. Children want to be like mom and dad. Childlike faith wants to imitate the father, but it doesn't want to take his place because they know that would be disastrous. Every child of God is grateful that he is in charge, that the safety is there of him being there. They don't want to be in charge. In this reality, it produces an abundant amount of joy and peace to God's children, despite the hardships, suffering, and, and difficulties that plague the world today because of sin. Because even though all creation is groaning, the sons and daughters of God know this is their father's world. And it's still amazing. Which brings us to the last point. Childlike faith is full of wonder at our father's world. It's full of wonder at our father's world. In 2006, a team of landscape architects conducted a study on the response of pre-K school children to the presence or absence of a fence around a playing ground. Listen to this from the study. By observing teachers and their students on the playground surrounded by a fence and on the comparable playground with no fence, the researchers found a striking difference in how the children interacted in the space. On playgrounds without fences, the children tended to gather around the teacher and were reluctant to stray far from view. On playgrounds that were fenced in, however, they ran all around the entire playground, feeling more free to explore. The researchers concluded that with a boundary in this case, a fence, children felt more at ease to explore the space. Childlike faith understands who truly is in charge. God is. He under, we understand that he sets the boundaries, that he has hedged off this world in a certain way. It's to be looked at and viewed in a certain way, were to act in a certain way. He's made things with a specific order, and he's also placed tons of potential in the field of this universe to be discovered, and there's freedom to discover it within those boundaries. Knowing this gives children a glorious freedom to be creative, to cultivate the ground, and to delight in the magnificence of this huge global garden he's placed us in to tend. And believing this reality is crucial for you and me to truly recapture the wonder of our Father's world. See, children of God delight in the beauty of the Father's creation, its simplicity and its complexity. They say to him, you know, whatever I do, I'll do for you because I know you made the stars, the sun, and the moon. You, you made my friends, you made my family, you made puppies and climbing trees. You also made french fries and skyline, grippos and getta, you made sports cars and tractors, singing and trombones. He made brownies, birds, books, and beaches. And doesn't a beach sound nice this morning? <laughs> when you stop and think about it, this world our Lord has made is absolutely amazing. 
It's wonderful. It's not oppressive. People that don't worship Christ as king, they think the things of this world, the bodies they've been given, the people they've been put around, they're all oppressive. They all cramp their style because there's not enough room for all of them to be kings together. There's only one king and he set the boundaries. Within those boundaries, it's beautiful. There's a song that is a fun one to, to sing about this whole idea of the wonder of God's world. I'm not going to sing it, but um, I thought I might, but I was like, I'll see how I feel at the end of the sermon. Um, <laughs> but it says, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees and skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. And then at the end it says, This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Childlike faith is in wonder of the God who created the cosmos. So, 93%, 93%, give or take. That's per- the percentage of in-person time many of us have with our children between birth and high school graduation. Do we order our homes in a manner that is constantly bringing them to Jesus, that, that he might bless them? Or are we rebuking the thought like the disciples? When we think about our interactions with our kids, May it remind us that to such belongs the kingdom of God. As they rely on us to feed, clothe, provide for, and teach them, let us recall our Savior's words that the kingdom must be received like a child or no one can enter it. And if you find yourself in the final 10% of an in-person time with your adult children, they've left your home, treasure every single moment you get to behold their faces. And even if you failed to make a priority to bring them to Jesus in the past, you can start today. There's still 10% left. Because remember, our God has saved many of you and your brothers and sisters in this room this morning long after they left their mother and father's homes whether they were believers or not. And he can do it again. And he's, he's faithful. So you be faithful now. Show them Jesus every opportunity you have because he's mighty to save. Fellow children, let the little children come to Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, God, we proclaim just how abundant your righteousness, your wisdom, your riches of grace, your strength is, and how all of us in this room are all children. Weak, frail, needy, not self-sufficient relying upon every everything in you. God, I pray that if there are those here this morning that have not believed that they would be like a child, that you prick their heart and help them become like a child to believe in you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would help those of us in this room that maybe have grown curmudgeonly and and don't look at the world with wonder because of all the difficulties and there are difficulties and I don't want to just brush over those God but you have also provided joy and peace and thanksgiving in this world and we can have eternal life 
and life abundantly starting now. We see it with eyes like a child. God, help us, parents in this room, teachers, servants and student and children ministries, mentors of, of young people, God, to be super intentional with every in-person moment we have with these ones, to bring them to Jesus, to not hinder them from coming, knowing that such belongs your kingdom. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.